<laughs> and uh, we just really expect in this next season that God is going to continue to do even more and more amazing things in our lives. And that comes as we open up our hearts to him. It doesn't come as we understand. It's not about understanding. It's about trusting. And that's what we're talking about is how do you trust God? Last week we looked at you can trust God because we, we know he's faithful. Today we're looking... I got to tell you, I'm, I have to live these things in order to preach these things. And today we're looking at you can trust God when you fail. You know, I plan to do a different one. Someone told me I need to do a, another one, and I, they're all in they're all in queue, you know, because we got to trust God with our finances. You know, I, I was hoping to trust God when other people fail, because then you can be nice to them. But no, it's when you fail. We, um, scripture tells us that we all stumble in many ways. And if anyone does not stumble in what he says, he's a mature man who's able to control his whole body. I think if James was talking today, he'd include ladies in that. We're all going to have times when we feel like we fail others and feel like we fail God. And I find the tactic of the enemy is to remove us from fellowship with God when that happens. The tactic of the enemy is to say, you're never going to be good enough. You're never going to measure up. You're never going to change. You're always going to be the same way. You can't do anything to make this right. And we need to be aware of the enemy schemes. Because I am just as upset. Just as upset. Well, it affects me just as much as it affects anybody. The Bible includes several people who blew it and, and needed another chance. You know, there's the adulterous woman in John 8. There's Jonah in Jonah 1 and 2. I was going to focus on Jonah. Couldn't. We'll do that later. Esther in uh, Esther 4.10. You know, she needed another chance before she made it right. Uh, risked going to talk to the king. But the person that God drew me to this week was John Mark. And so we're going to do a quick synopsis of who John Mark is and what happened and how he blew up with God. John Mark, we, we find him in Acts chapter 12. His, he's the son of a woman named Mary. And Mary, this is the Mary that had the uh, prayer meeting when Peter was in jail and they were praying for something with him, but they didn't expect him to be released. And he was. But John Mark was there. Um, we know that in Acts 12, he was a companion of Barnabas and Paul. We find out in Colossians 4.10, he's actually Barnabas' uh, nephew, cousin, I mean, cousin. And uh, if you look in the book of Mark, we find that he's a follower of Jesus as well. In, in Acts 13, he was a helper on Paul and Barnabas' first missionary journey. Uh, they went out and they took him with them. And in Acts 15, we see that he deserted Paul and Barnabas in Pamphylia, and he left, he went back home. You know, we know his departure came right after a very intense spiritual battle in uh, Cyprus. If, uh, quickly, that story, Paul was talking, and, and this uh, Elamus was the pro council and he was contradicting him, and, Paul got so mad at him, he struck him with blindness. And only one person in Cyprus got saved because people respond to the kindness of God. <laughs> not, not striking people with blindness, apparently. Um, but you know, you know it was an intense spiritual thing happening there because John Mark had enough. He was done. He left. We see in Acts 15 that Paul and Barnabas had a sharp disagreement about John Mark. Because Barnabas, who was his cousin, wanted to bring him along on their next missionary journey. And Paul said, forget it. He's a deserter. He's going to leave again. No way. We're not going to. I don't have a second chance for this loser. And they disagreed so much that Barnabas and Mark went one way and Paul and 
silence with the other. We find out later on in Philemon that Paul calls John Mark a fellow worker. <coughs> and, and in 2 Timothy, near the end of Paul's life, he says, get Mark and bring him to with you because he is helpful to me in my ministry. We have huge gaps in the life of John Mark. But we know he failed. And we know good things happen despite of that failure. We know that, that he should have been put on a shelf, was put on a shelf by Paul. And oh, by the way, this is the guy that wrote the Gospel of Mark. He did something that kind of lasted, you know? He did something that lasted, stood the test of time. Have you ever felt like John Mark might have? When he was, had this awesome opportunity and he was there in the thick of it and he had enough, he just had to, you know, it's not for me, it's not my time, it's not what I wanted to do. I changed my profession, I'm just gonna go. When that happens, my advice would be okay, it's time to strengthen yourself in the Lord. My advice would be Okay, you got to know what the Bible says about failure. You've got to know who God is. You've got to know that you can trust God in your failure. So let's quickly go there. That's the second page. Come here, you can flip it. When you feel like a failure, sometimes you feel like a failure, it's just imagine. Sometimes you really did fail, and you, you got to make it right. Failure is not fatal, nor is it defining. But God can use it for something good. First of all, it happens to all of us. Proverbs 24, 16a says, A godly man may trip seven times, but they will get up again. Guess what? God knows everything. That's his attribute. He is omniscient. Nothing you did surprised him. He didn't say, oh, what? look at that. Oh, he messed up and I didn't see it coming. God is greater than our hearts and he knows all things. 1 John 30. You can trust God because he already knew you were going to fail when you failed. And he didn't squish you before. He's not going to squish you now. Secondly, the Lord holds your hands. Uh, Psalm 37, 23 and 24. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall for the Lord upholds them by the hand. The attribute there is God is good. That is who he is. That is why we can trust him when we fail because he is good. He is going to see the good that he started in you completed. He's going to do it. Psalm 25, 8, the good, good and upright is the Lord. You can trust God when you fail. Number three, Jesus is the answer. Romans 7, 15 and 24 and 25. I don't really understand myself, Paul says, for what I want to do, I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I, I do what I hate. Well, what a miserable person am I? Who will free me from this life that is dominated by sin and death? Thank God the answer is Christ Jesus our Lord. Our God is righteous. That is his attribute. That is who he is. And because he's righteous, He's made the way for you already to come and get forgiveness for when things when you when you fail. Psalm 145, the Lord is righteous in all his ways and gracious in all his, his works. Because of that, you can trust God when you fail. Number four, you're forgiven. 1 John 1 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The attribute is God is love. And nothing, nothing, nothing can separate us from it. Right? Your favorite verse. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, neither height nor depth nor anything created shall be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. When you fail him, you can trust him because of his love. 
Because of His love, you can trust Him. Number five, there's no condemnation. Romans 8, 1 and 2. Now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Jesus Christ. And because you belong to Him, the power of the life-giving Spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. The attribute is our God rules with true justice. It's justice. His attribute is justice. There is nobody who can condemn when He calls us right. That includes you. Quit beating yourself up if you fail and you need to get back again. you got to make it right and keep on going on. You can trust God when you fail because He is just. Number six, His grace is all you need. 2 Corinthians 12, 9 and 11. Each time He said, my grace is all you need. My power works best in weakness. So now I'm glad to boast about my weakness so that the power of Christ can work through me. That's why I take pleasure in my weakness and the insults and hardships and persecution and troubles that I suffer for Christ. For when I am weak, then I am strong. The attribute of God is, is God is full of grace. Romans 1, 5, for through him we have received grace. Listen, when it comes to grace, my one warning comes from 1 Corinthians 5, 15, 10. I don't think I got it up there. <laughs> by God's grace, Paul writes, by God's grace, I am what I am. And his grace was not without effect. His grace that he shows you is his kindness that leads you to repentance. It's that kindness that draws you into his ways. It's his kindness who brings you back into his arms. That's the grace. It needs to transform us. It needs to change us. It's cheap if we just rely on the fact that he's not going to get angry at us. He's just happy. His justice demands that his grace rules in our lives. Number seven, the Lord is your strength. Psalm 20, uh, 73, 26, my heart may fail and my spirit may grow weak, but God remains the strength of my heart. He is mine forever. The attribute is God is Emmanuel. He is with us. He didn't surprise him when he failed. He didn't leave you when you failed. He's still there. Acts 17 says he's not far from each of us, and for in him we live and we move and we have our being. You can trust God when you fail, because even when you fail, He's the one that sustains you. He's the one that upholds you. He's the one that lets you make it make it right. Number eight, there's fresh mercies. Lamentations 3, 22 and 23. The faithful love of the Lord never ends. His mercies never cease. Great is His faithfulness. His mercies begin afresh every morning. The attribute is God is merciful. That mercy is who he is. It's his attribute. It's, it's how we know him. Ephesians 2, 4 says, God who is rich in mercy. When we fail, we need his mercy. We need him. And you can trust him because you have it. He is merciful. Number nine, we can forget the past. Philippians 3, 13 to 14. Dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it all, but I focus on this one thing. Focusing on the, the past and looking forward to what lies ahead, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Christ Jesus is calling us. The attribute is immutability. God doesn't change. When he, you can trust when he's forgiven you. When, when you've repented, you can trust that he's forgiven you. Then our job is to live up to what we've attained. Then our job is to make it right. Every good and perfect gift comes from above and does it, comes from the Father of lights with him. There's no variation of shadow returning. You can trust God when you fail. I got to tell you that this week I felt like I failed. in the back of my mind for a while it was brought into the light and I just got to tell you what it is like I wish I could do this with this when Pam is here she's here next week I'm going to apologize to her then I'm going to apologize to all of you now who were offended 
of what happened. A few months ago, we had uh, Kevin and Candy up to pray for them and bless them as they left the board. And I was confused whether or not we had done that with Pam and I didn't hear that we had talked to her and she came up and I said, oh, did we pray for you? And she said, no. And I said, oh, that's awkward. And I should have said, we should pray for you now. Can we pray for you now? I never did. And I understand the offense people took at that because we need to honor her. We, we, she's done so much for the church and I in no way meant to dishonor her. I in no way meant to make it uncomfortable for her. But I did, and it was wrong. And if that offended you, please forgive me. I'm going to make it right with Pam. When I was dealing with all this was when I was going working through this message. And if you look at the life of Mark, we don't see him going off and, and encouraging himself in the Lord. We don't see him spending hours in the Psalms saying, this is the truth of what God said, so this is who I am. We see a totally different approach that God uses time and time and time again when someone fails. John Mark literally had a Barnabas. Barnabas means son of encouragement. His real name was Joseph, and he was a Levite in Cyprus. And yeah, he was his cousin, but he was the one that stood up to his friend Paul and said, no, we've got to invest in this kid. We can't let him sit on the shelf. We've got to let him have his place because God has something good for him, and i got to make sure that that happens. Barnabas is an amazing character of the Bible. Like we just, just, he is the son of encouragement. He had the encouragement of finances. The first time we see him in Acts chapter 4, Joseph, who the disciples called Barnabas because he encouraged people so much, sold the land in, Cyprus, uh, sold land in Cyprus and came and laid it at the apostles' feet in Jerusalem and said, hey, share it with everybody. You can have that ministry of encouragement with finances. I, I tell you, it makes a difference in people's lives. A couple of weeks ago, someone gave us a love offering that totally unexpected. I didn't know who it was, but hey, it was school supply week and we could buy clothes and we could, like, it was just fun. We were so blessed when someone did that for us. It doesn't have to be a lot of money, but when God lays it on your heart, you can be that Barnabas to someone. You can just, you can take them out for coffee. You can bless them with a gift card. Whatever God is telling you to do, you, there is a ministry of being encouraged with finances, by finances. Know the good you can do. It doesn't have to be a huge thing. But understand, God has blessed you so you can bless others. And, and really, it's our responsibility to find out who God wants us to bless. We see Barnabas again in Acts 11. And by the way, if you read through these portions, you see everywhere Barnabas is, the church grows. <laughs> and for... You know, and he lays, lays it at the feet of the, of the disciples, and then, you know, Ananias and Sapphira wants to do the same thing, and then they die, and then the church grows. But, like, he's, he's around when the church grows. And in, in chapter 11, the same thing. He goes and he finds Saul. Saul, Saul comes. Uh, you know, he just had that Damascus experience. And if you are, are a Christian in the early part of the church, you don't really want to become friends with someone who used to kill you, like last week. You, you don't want to do that. And Barnabas did. He went and he met with Saul. And he introduced him to the disciples and said, Listen, this guy's legit. I've seen the change in him. That's the encouragement of fellowship. 
there people on your heart who, who have seen like they, they either put themselves on a shelf or they were put on a shelf by someone else? I want you to start thinking about how you can bring them into your fellowship and introduce them to the rhythms of your life. It's the people in your everyday world. It's, it's the ones you rub shoulders with. It's your family, it's your friends, it's your neighbors, it's your coworkers. Who is God asking you to come alongside and just, just bring into fellowship? That doesn't mean having coffee with us Sunday morning. It might, because that's part of the rhythm of your life. But it could very well be just inviting them over when you celebrate a birthday party or invite them over where when when you're doing some service for somebody else you know invite them into the rhythms of your life you need all of us all of us it's just not for the someone we're gonna call Barnabas because he's so good at it all of us need to encourage each other this way then in chapter Acts chapter 13 we, we see the encouragement of followership. Fellowship, not fellowship, fellowship. This isn't original with me. I think it was Chuck Swindoll who came up with this word. Fellowship. What does that mean? Beginning of Acts chapter 1, it says the Holy Spirit, they're praying and the Holy Spirit tells them, set apart Barnabas and Saul for the work that I got them called to. It was Barnabas and Saul. Then you go through the book, uh, the chapter 13, and by the end of it, it's Paul and Barnabas decided this. The names got switched. Barnabas was that guy that came along and said, Paul, my ceiling is going to be your floor. How can I promote you? How can I see you grow into your destiny? You know what that means to someone when you can come alongside and you, you like, they got more talent than you. <laughs> I love meeting people like that. I love it when you can just be like, okay, I don't know what God has for you, but I'm going to do everything I can to, to just give you that platform, give you that performance, maybe give you that opportunity. It's just not for me to do. You can do that too. It's in your everyday world. People need, it could be in, in a craft that you're good at and you, you find one of your friends that likes to do it too and you just launch them. For me, because I speak, hey, I got invited to go to Pakistan and speak at a 40,000 person crusade. And my first question was, can we not call it a crusade in Pakistan? And my second question was, can I get this other guy who uh, is really needs to go and do that because he's, he's the one that has visions of preaching in those kind of places and then those, that kind of deal. You know, like it's not, that's what we need to have. The encouragement that could come, the encouragement you can give to someone this week you know, it can, it can come, it's more intentional than a smile, it's more intentional than a hug, it's, it's God, how can you use me to bless someone this week? It could be with finances, and that could be the easiest way to do it, and, and, and it might not be easy because of where you're at, but honestly, <laughs> sometimes it's easier. It could be calling them, like, and, and you know, they're, they're not in church for lots of reasons, or they're, they're not, they're on the shelf because of hurt and pain, and are you going to call, call them and walk alongside them and invite them into the rhythms of your life? Or maybe there's someone that you, you've got that, they're better than you in something, and you just can come alongside and learn from them and launch them at the same time. I was, I had all that prepared. And I was thinking, okay, God, that would be really cool. I wonder who could do that for me. Because this past week, I was, I was, I was wondering if, if the journey that we're on, if it's going to be worth it. Because I know what we have to go through. I've been here before. We've seen a church come back and I know the pain that that brings because you want to hang on to the past but God's telling you to go forward. And, and I, I've been in meetings and I've had those coffees and I, I, I just, it's they're painful. They hurt. And 
And I had one too many conversations that criticized one too many things. And I was like, okay, God, how do I get out of this? Well, I remembered a pastor friend, not really a pastor friend. I met him once and he said, we should go for coffee. I said, sure. We never went for coffee. He had left his church and he had started another church. And honestly, I was thinking, I wonder what the other church is like, this first church. Let's go out for coffee and I'll just pick his brain to see if it's even worth considering. And we sat down and we talked about life and we talked about church and he asked what's happening at Harvest. I said, there's some very important people who are feeling God has called them away. And then for the next 45 minutes, hour, he kicked my butt. <laughs> he said, and you're taking responsibility for all of this and it's all your fault and you're not good enough and you can't do that. It's like, you, you are representing Christ to these people. They crucified him. What did you expect? Grow up. He said, did you expect anything worse? You knew what was going to happen. You told them when you came that you're, the people were going to leave at some point And everyone said, oh, that'll never happen. We already lost everybody. It's like, no, it has to happen because that's just how it works. That's how transformation takes place. And it's not nice and it's not fun and it hurts. But honestly, he kicked my butt. And I knew as he was doing it, it was kicking his own butt too, because he who ref refreshes others will they themselves be refreshed. And I knew he was talking to himself more than he was talking to me because he was getting really personal and it had nothing to do with me.